this is 1.7 periodic trends. Our outcome is I can explain the relationship between trends in atomic properties of elements and the electronic structure and periodicity. So we're going to start out by talking about the shell model here. So the shell model says that uh, electrons must be supplied energy in order to pull an electron away from a nucleus. So if I wanted to make a positively charged cation, I would need to add uh, energy in order to get rid of that electron. So the ionization energy is that amount of energy. It's how much energy do I need to remove an electron from an atom in its gaseous state. So chemists report ionization energies per mole, and I give you the ionization energy for a single atom. So we want to convert this into uh, megajoules per mole. So I know that it's joules per one hydrogen atom, um, and then I'm going to take the number of atoms in a mole and multiply that, so that will give me joules per mole, and then I'm just going to convert joules into megajoules. So for atoms with many electrons, not all electrons are the same distance from the nucleus. So in this case, which electron would have the lowest ionization energy, the one that is closest or farthest from the nucleus? So the one that is farthest away is going to be the most weakly held electron. It will have the weakest attraction to its nucleus, so it will require a lower amount of ionization energy to get rid of it. Now. The next one says to predict the trend in ionization energy. So I've got a uh, by atomic number here and then ionization energy. Now this is not the correct relationship, but this is the relationship that most people would guess. We would assume that as our core charge of our nucleus goes from plus one to plus two to plus three, that the ionization energy would increase uh, because the nucleus is becoming more positive. But this doesn't match experimental observations. This is what we actually see. So we see an increasing trend and then it drops. Increasing trend and then it drops. And if you look on the periodic table, each of these drops corresponds to a new row on the periodic table. So um, the models here are showing us a hydrogen atom and a helium atom. We want to try to explain why the first ionization energy of helium is about twice that of hydrogen. So whenever we talk about the first ionization energy, or IE1, uh, that just means the first electron and then the second electron and so on and so forth. But if you look at these uh, electrons, they're both the same distance from the nucleus, but the charge on the helium nucleus is twice as positive as the charge on the hydrogen nucleus. So that means there's twice the amount of attraction, and we're going to need about twice as much ionization energy to remove the electron. So the uh, ionization energy for hydrogen is 1.31 megajoules per mole. So if all three electrons on lithium were in the first shell, like we see here in model one, we would expect the attraction to the nucleus to be three times that of hydrogen because the charge is three times as positive. Um, so we would expect, if they were all the same distance, that the ionization energy would be large. Uh, but what we do find is that the first ionization energy of lithium is not three times that of hydrogen. In fact, if we look at this graph, it's way less than that of hydrogen. So the best explanation for that is that some of those electrons are not at the same distance from the nucleus. So model two is more consistent with what we would expect uh, because we see that difference in ionization energy. It must mean that that first electron, that valence electron that gets pulled away, must be further from the nucleus than the inner two. So valence electrons are the outermost shell. Uh, and the ones that are closer to the nucleus are called inner shell electrons. So uh, here we see the shell model for beryllium, and we see the core charge model for beryllium. And the difference is, in the core charge model, all that we see is the nucleus, the center, the core, and then we see the outer valence electrons. 
So how many inner shell and valence electrons does beryllium have? Two valence, two inner. Uh, how did we calculate this core charge here? So we did the charge on the nucleus, which was plus four, minus the number of inner electrons, which was two, and that leaves us with the core charge. So basically, the number of valence electrons is equal to the core charge. So if the valence shell of lithium and beryllium are the same distance from the nuclei, uh, how are the core charges consistent with the first ionization for lithium and for beryllium? So lithium has a core charge of plus one, whereas beryllium has a core charge of plus two. So if they are the same distance from the nucleus, the ionization energy for Be should be about twice the ionization energy for lithium. So considering uh, sodium and lithium, uh, they both have one valence electron, so they both have the same core charge. But when we look at the ionization energy, we see that it's a little tiny bit bigger for lithium than it is for sodium. So this means that the valence electron that's in that 2s shell uh, must be a little bit closer than the valence electron in the 3s shell on sodium. Neon has a higher ionization energy value than sodium. How is this consistent with their core charges? So neon will have a core charge of plus eight and sodium will have a core charge of plus one. So neon's nucleus is more positive and it holds on more tightly to its electrons. So we can talk about uh, atomic radius and how this relates. Uh, so we have data for several atoms given here. What is the relationship between the valence shell and its position on the periodic table? So each shell corresponds to an energy level, uh, which really just is a code word for electrons at different distances from the nucleus, uh, which are given by each row on the periodic table. So row one is energy level one and so forth and so on. Uh, this is how we know that the periodic table should be arranged the way that we see it. This is how we know where each row ends, uh, and it's based on experimental observations like ionization energy, and then supported by other observations like trends in reactivity and other periodic trends. So why does the core charge increase as we move from uh, left to right? Uh, core charge increases moving left to right because we are adding uh, additional protons to the nucleus. So what trend do we see in atomic radius as we go from left to right? The radius gets smaller because the core charge is being more positive. So the valence electrons are held more tightly um, by that columbic attraction to the nucleus. What about as we go down a group? So the core charge is remaining the same, but there's more layers of electrons. There's more filled energy levels, so the radius will get larger. So we want to estimate the radius of three atoms that are not given in the data. So for nitrogen, I said it would probably be about 70, and this is because it has the same energy levels as carbon and oxygen, but the core charge is in between that of carbon and oxygen. Uh, then I did uh, GE, and I said about 110, um, because it's going to have the same energy levels as um, acetonime, but it's going to have a smaller core charge. Uh, but at the same time, it should also still be bigger than sulfur, because it has one more energy level than sulfur. And I'm going to guess that chlorine's probably around 100. It should be a little smaller than S. So this is uh, the ionic radii for several isoelectronic ions. What that means is that they have the same number of electrons. So all of these have 18 total electrons. And what we see is that the more positive the core charge, the smaller the radius gets. So between oxygen uh, anion and fluoride anion, oxide and fluoride, uh, which is going to be larger? 
So the oxide, O minus 2 ion, is larger than the fluoride ion. They're both isoelectric. They both have 10 electrons. But uh, fluoride, fluorine, has more protons, so a slightly more positive nucleus. This data is showing some more uh, radii of atoms and ions. So if we look at uh, fluorine and fluoride, they have the same core charge, uh, but they have different radiuses. And this is because of electron to electron repulsions. As you're adding more electrons um, to an atom, those repulsions between electrons get more significant. So because fluoride has one more electron, those electron-electron repulsions are a little bit stronger, and then we find that the electrons are a little bit further away from the nucleus, and it's going to be a little bit larger radius. Predicting a value for uh, the nitrogen anion, for nitride. Uh, so N minus 3 has 8 valence electrons and a core charge of plus 5. Uh, if I compare it to oxygen and fluoride, the difference is um, about 7 picometers. Uh, but they're all isoelectric with 8 valence electrons. So I would imagine that I would continue the trend and uh, the N minus 3 ion should be about 7 picometers bigger than O minus 2. So around 147. So what three characteristics of an atom or ion do we need to know to determine its relative radius? So we need to know the core charge in the valence shell, how many valence shells there are, and we need something that tells us about how many electrons there are. So either the charge of the atom or ion or the number of valence electrons in the atom or ion. Uh, so on your reflection questions here, these are two periodic trends that we didn't talk about. But the thing with periodic trends is if you understand core charge and shell model and you understand that, uh, all these are just vocabulary words. As long as you know what these mean, you can figure out the trend. So electron affinity, the likelihood of a neutral atom gaining an electron. So when you think about the periodic table, um, think about like uh, comparing sodium and oxygen. Sodium, whenever it forms an ion, it forms a cation. It doesn't gain electrons. It loses electrons, whereas oxygen gains them. And that's going to be related to that core charge on the nucleus. Electronegativity, I also call it uh, a measure of sexiness, how well an atom attracts electrons that are shared in a bond. So, uh, for example, in a fluorine to fluorine bond, the electrons are shared equally. But in a hydrogen to fluorine bond, uh, the electrons are shared closer to the F atom. So this is because that nucleus, again, is more attractive to those electrons, so it pulls the electron density away from hydrogen towards fluoride. 